The role of the prophet is very often to bring bad news. Uh, they come down from the mountain with the message that the management is not pleased with how things are going down here. Um, and I think one of the things about our current crises is that even our scientists have become, in essence, a kind of prophetic voice about how apocalyptic things are appearing mm -hmm. on the horizon. So I know that your astronomer Royale, uh, Reese, actually questioned whether or not we'd survive the 21st century. Yes. So on that negative note. There is a temptation when you've seen the, the extent to which things that we value are being undermined to simply to point this out and relay a negative message but uh, to do that is in a way to betray your duty towards young people because many young people have inklings of course that things aren't going right but they want to be given a sign a sign that there's a way of life and a way of relating to others that uh, will enable them to uh, avoid this disaster uh, and achieve the kind of fulfillment that is in their nature to achieve. Richard Weaver, who, who wrote uh, Ideas Have Consequences, he says that we cannot combat those who have fallen prey to historical optimism. And then he says, such is the task, and our most serious obstacle is that people traveling this downward path develop an insensibility which increases with their degradation. And I think one of the things that, that for me is really striking about a lot of modern culture is how incredibly degraded it is and how insensible so many people are mm. to the level of degradation. You were talking earlier about you know, just what sort of things should we be concerned to preserve uh, and what should be our attitude to innovation and progress. Many people will say, uh, take the gay marriage issue for instance, many of its defenders will say, look, this is the uh, progress, it's the adaptation of an old institution, an old way of do doing things to changes in society right. which would, it would be foolish to oppose. Uh, uh, rather than oppose and create conflict, we should accommodate and adapt. And that I think is a, a not necessarily the right argument about this issue, but it is something which um, uh, uh, is tempting. That, that way of, uh, of arguing is very tempting. Uh, and there is a gr big question for religious people as, the, as to the extent to which they can adapt. You know, um, if you haven't got any faith, you might think it's easy to adapt. But if you have a faith, one of the things that faith gives, gives to you is certainties. And you can't adapt a certainty so, so that it uh, fits a new circumstance, because then it ceases to be a certainty. And I think that these are issues which are, uh, oh no, I've wrestled with this all, all my life and a lot of other people have wrestled with it. You know, just what are you prepared to give up in order to live on peaceful terms with neighbors who disagree with you? Right, you know? well we have this, this concept in, in uh, the Islamic tradition that what, what are called thawabit and mutagayyarat. Mm -hmm. The idea that there are f uh, fixities that cannot be changed, can't be yeah. altered. One of the things that I see in the United States that's happening that's troubling to me is a lot of young Muslims are, are, are abandoning those, those thawabit, those things mm -hmm. that really, once you begin to abandon them, y your religion unravels yeah. like, like uh, pulling the thread on, yeah. on, on a woven garment. Going back to the question of images, you know, which I did mention, we are suffering from a surfeit of images. There's no doubt about it in our society. Uh, and the prophet was absolutely right about this. The, the, the image of the human face and the human form captures your attention, wherever it is, yes. and on a billboard or whatever. Uh, and if it's a sexually attractive one, it's, it captures your attention in another way. Um, but this use of the human uh, image to distract us from from, from the, uh, the serious business of living is one of the things that we're having to deal with. Right. Uh, and um, I, I, one, one thing to be said in praise of the Western artistic tradition, uh, as it, in its great moments of the medieval and Renaissance painters, is that it, 
didn't just use the image as a distracting thing. It was a, fo- a way of focusing your attention on divine things. Right. The icon um, tradition. Yeah, and that, that sort of saves the image, as it were, lifts it out of this world right. into, the, into the place where it belongs. Transcendent. Um, and I think we, we're now... It's again, it's something that is so difficult to talk about because our whole culture is based on the proliferation of images, uh, meaningless images designed to titillate appetites. Mm. One of the things that fascinates me about um, people in the 19th century when when photography first was introduced, uh, I, I, I have not found, I've yet to find any person from the 19th century smiling in yeah, a photograph. Yeah, that's, that's uh, right. It really, and, and when, when I was in Rome and went to where they had all the statues of, all, none of them were smiling, not mm. one of them. And, and I thought a lot about that because even the Native Americans, those incredible pictures by Curtis of these great uh, Native mm. American pupils like Geronimo yeah. and, and some of the great chiefs of the Lakota, they're all, all of them have this incredible presence yeah. and 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 what to me what it was saying was a moment is being frozen mm. of of my being yeah. and i want it to be a moment of seriousness yeah. that that, that I'm a serious person. And this idea of, uh, Mark Van Dorn wrote a beautiful essay, it was actually a commencement speech for a college, and he entitled it, The Joy of Being Serious. Mm. That's a lovely idea, yeah. Well, it, that's absolutely right. People used to pose for photographs, not so as to be just the momentary cheerful thing, but to present their whole life if they could. And that meant sort of, as it were, standing to attention as a guard of yourself. Um, and um, all 19th century photographs, for that reason, have this incredible solemnity. Um, we've lost that, and of course, the selfie is the kind of the, the ultimate limit of this. You know, you're uh, just nothing really matters except this idiot smiling face in front of it. Right. Um, uh, if you go to uh, that was the word of the year a couple of years ago, and I, I thought it was interesting mm. in Arabic. One of the things that I always do with with words is I translate them into Arabic to mm. see how they sound, <laughs> and and the word in Arabic nafsi yeah, yeah. is probably one of the most negative terms right. in the Islamic tradition. Right. You know, so you would call a selfie a nafsi, mm. <laughs> and it's basically it's it's an egoistic. Uh, narcissistic type of right. thing. There's there's a tradition where the Prophet Muhammad, uh, somebody knocked on his door so loud, he said, um, and he said, who's there? And the man said, Anna, which mm-hmm. is me. Right. Yeah. And many Arabs will actually, when when they're talking and they want to say they did something, they'll say, Anna, wa a'udhu billahi min Anna. Mm-hmm. You know, they say I, and then they say, and I seek refuge in Allah from I, <laughs> as yeah. as a kind of way of saying I don't I don't want to boast. Right. And 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 so when the Prophet heard that, he said, Anna, Anna, and in the commentary of the Hadith, the the narrator says, as if he disliked it. Right. In other yeah. words, say who you are. Don't say yeah, yeah. I, as if we are supposed to know right. who you are. And I think the the idea, and Weaver again talks about this um, this egoistic, I mean, he, he saw it as an inf- infantile self that was emerging, the spoiled child. He calls it the spoiled child in, mm. in his book, which, which to me is fascinating that he wrote it in 1946 mm. uh, and was already seeing this long before the culture of narcissism, for instance, came out yeah. back in the 70s. But increasingly, you talked about sacrifice, and, and I... I wonder if sacrifice is even possible in in its etymological sense of sacris facere, of making sacred. Mm. This idea of, of sacrifice being so fundamental to our religious traditions. Well, yes, that's... Uh, you know, obviously the Christian religion is founded on an act of sacrifice, um, the sacrifice of Christ uh, on the cross. And that um, has deep anthropological resonances. uh, uh, It connects Christianity to all kinds of ancient uh, mystery cults right. in a way which uh, which Islam is not connected. I mean, Islam is a kind of break from all that. So, um, but uh, it's normal for Christians to think that that act of sacrifice 
in which the Son of God was himself uh, the victim, but also forgave those who were who were perpetrating this crime. That that act of sacrifice is a model for us in the sense that if he could bear that for our sake, then you can surely bear the things that you have to bear for others' sake. You know, and so sacrifice the things that you want. Sacrifice your pleasures and your, uh, your own well-being for others and know that you're, doing, uh, you're, you're following in his path. That, and I think that's a, you know, obviously a beautiful idea. The same idea is there in Islam too, of course. Uh, absolutely, and, I, and, and it's most honored in the mother. Yeah. Because in the Islamic tradition, paradise is at the feet of the mother and, and it's, it's predicated on the idea of her sacrifice. Right. the amount of time she gives. And one of the things that we're seeing increasingly in Western society is a lot of people don't want to have children yes. because of the, the sacrifice involved in it. That's, all, that's true, but there are very few children who don't want to have mothers. <laughs> you know, the, it's a mu not a mutual thing. Right. Uh, Levi Strauss argued that binaries were, were at the essence of civilization. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I think you talk about in the um, Fools, Frauds, and Fire, uh, Firebrands uh, is, is this inversion that's happened, like people yeah. like Derrida, who, who want to eliminate, in essence, the idea of binaries, that binaries by their nature are oppressive because if, if you have the binary of male, female, of, of, of day and night, yeah. of dark, light and dark, that there's one, one of the binaries is privileged yeah. over the other. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the thing to do is to get rid of these and then it becomes, and androgyny becomes a kind of... Um, Which is the norm. Where, where men are, are mm. meant to get rid of their toxic masculinity yeah. and, and the women are to get rid of their femininity and we kind of merge into yes. an androgynous being which will remove this, um, this mm. binary that by its nature is oppressive and hierarchical. Well, and then, of course, you get the idea that, that first of all, that sex is not always about this other thing called gender. And gender is something you can choose it has been remade as, a, as an artificial thing. That's the problem. Uh, the, you know, we always thought that, that there are certain things which can't be changed. Right. Or they're part of your destiny. Uh, and what you have to do is recognize this, accept it, uh, and uh, adapt it to the way of life which you choose. But that uh, has now um, ceased to be a, a principle. Well, I think the, the, the Quran, and certainly in the Hadith, there, there's an idea that of this fitra, which is a principial nature. Mm. There's, there's a principial nature to the human being, and, but that it can be corrupted. Right. And, and, and the Quran actually, in, in, the, in uh, the 30th chapter, there's a verse that says, that this is the, the nature that God has made you on, the human being. Fitratullah lati fatra nas alayha. So God has, and he's fatir, which is the originator of this nature. And, and then it says, do not change the nature of God. And there's a debate amongst the grammarians. Mm. Is that negation that you cannot change it or is it a prohibition? And most of the commentators say it's a prohibition, meaning that the nature can change. And we know you were at the Witherspoon conference where we yeah. were, and the neuroscientist who gave his lecture on, on the effects of pornography on the yeah. brain, he was basically arguing that a brain can be rewired, well, yeah. that there's a type of plasticity. But aren't we now, and this is another issue which I didn't touch on at all in my talk, but the, uh, the, the problem of the the, the emerging human being today uh, who takes all his information from this little screen in his hand uh, and relates to other people through that screen and perhaps often doesn't have really the ability to talk in an articulate way, to confess to his feelings or to, to uh, relate. It's all text messages and images um, and, it, and this is a very addictive thing for the reasons that the prophet himself recognized, you know, that, that uh, you're rewiring your brain 
in, in this process, and I, I suspect we will. We are producing a new human type. There, there is a new type that's emerging. Yeah, and that's um, it is very worrying then because you don't really know how to, how to respond to that. What uh, you know, a sort of a, a well-meaning liberal response would be, well, yeah, we're producing a new human type, so there we are. We have to get used to it, and we'll deal with it. You know, it, it, um, it is, it's not for us to, well, to try to change it. But yeah, and technology is enabling. Uh, an article came out. Uh, just, I think it was yesterday or today, uh, in the Washington Post, that there's 70 million more men, uh, young men than women in India and China because yeah. of the abortions yeah. of these uh, of the girls. So yeah. they they would do the the uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the ultrasound, and when they saw that they were going to yes. have a girl, they would abort it. And so now they're saying that you've got. Uh, a widespread rape because these yeah, men course. are going out and yeah. and also women now are being imported into China and and because they're not Chinese then they tend to get into situations where they're abused by family yes. members and things. So All this is um, worrying and alarming but as we have to say also that we can't Remedy all these things, right. but we've we've pr provided ourselves with instruments like the ultrasound thing and like the um, the, the iPhone, uh, which can be used to radically change the human species and perhaps to harm it. Um, our, our moral values come from our being the things that we are, so they don't equip us to deal with things that we are not. And yet things that we are not might be coming into being. Well, how do we deal with them? Uh, you know, uh, this is a, a real question. You, you, you're okay. You can sit here and you've got a nice collection of students. You can tell them that the things that you think are true and you know they're going to respond and be okay about it. But um, there's all that world out there. No, they're which, grappling here. Right, I mean, okay. <laughs> but there's, there's, there is the world out there which is not responding to you and me. Right. Uh, uh, and it is producing right. uh, new human types and new forms of networks and relationships which we can't necessarily deal with on the basis of the uh, moral inheritance that we already have. And, and I think one of the problems for somebody like you is it, it becomes a type of Cassandra situation hmm. where I think it was Kierkegaard who said that one man can't save the world, but he can certainly help show the world where they're going. Yeah. And, and he, he argued that, that most people could not see where the world was going because they, they lacked a dialectical ability and the imagination to do so. Mm. But we have people that do see where the world's going and, and have for quite some time. Technology is one area that, that is, can sacred truths survive in a world in which technology begins to not be a tool yeah. but becomes very much uh, a, a, a the force thing, in the world. The that, thing in charge. It, exactly, that, it, mm. that, that we become servants of, of, the, uh, of the technology as opposed to the technology serving us. Well, what do you think one should do about that? I mean, they, they, we know that this is true. Various writers foresaw all this, especially, of, of course, Aldous Huxley in Brave New World. Ex yeah, Huxley's uh, a good uh, example. Uh, uh, and um, George Orwell in 1984. I've always taken the view you can only influence a small number of people, and you can only do it in the end by setting an example. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, setting things up where you are also central to what you're setting up, right. as you do in a family. You know, and you set an example to your children, um, who then reject it completely, of course. But still, you know, um, you, you've done your bit when that happens. Well, hopefully, and over time, they begin to see the wisdom of some of yes. the things. I mean, I certainly saw it with my own parents. Yes. Uh, of course, um, uh, um, but I, I'm, uh, you know, one goes through a period of rebellion, but if they've done their work correctly, the parents, you come back to mm -hmm. uh, affirming the, the, the good bits of what they had tried to communicate to you. But so many, in the world in which we are today, where there are so many children who come into being without parents or with only a, a half of a parent, you know, there, there's a real problem. And, and then the first, all that is given to them is addictive distractions. 
You know, what are you, what's, uh, what's going to come out of that? that no, I, I'm talking in a very negative way. And I, my, as I said before, it's wrong to talk purely negatively. No, absolutely. Um, I think one of your great critiques of, of uh, a certain mindset is the destructive aspect of yeah. that mindset, that pe there are people that want to tear down. And I think w it seems to me that you've dedicated your life to conserving what's good of the past that, that's very important. But, but I, one thing I want to ask you about this, um, the, 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 uh, I think one of the big challenges for people that take a conservationist approach to, 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 to conserving mm. these things of the past, they're up against a lot of modern people that don't see a lot of good in the past, mm. um, especially marginalized people. Who's, who see a lot of negative aspects of the past. And one of the things that religion, I think, has always been capable of doing is holding people up, even in the worst mm. type of uh, despondency, that there's this ability to elevate the soul or the self. But for conservative people to recognize a lot of these critiques um, that are being uh, mm. put forward, uh, and that are so seductive to people that are marginalized, that are disenfranchised, and that feel that pain. W yeah. What, 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 what do we do with, with the marginalized? Yeah, I mean, the fact is, often people get a lot of self-glamour out of representing themselves to themselves as marginalized. You know, if, you, if you've uh, been a person of old-fashioned conservative views in a modern university, as I was, you are seriously marginalized. But you don't make a fuss about it and say, look, I'm a victim, help me. You, you just recognize that you've got views which expose you to a certain kind Ridicule. of... Uh, yeah, yeah, belligerence. But um, it, it's people, when people think that they're marginalized in such a way that they themselves can do nothing to remedy the right. situation, that's when it's dangerous. Uh, um, but we live in a society which which has institutions through which all that is mediated people can protest people can say look um, it's all very well for you but what about me uh, and in the past you know people have always taken note of this and said yeah well let's explain to me your problem let's see whether we can help one of the things you've written about is uh, architecture and the importance of architecture and sacred mm. space. And for me, one of the, the important things and aspects about uh, a space to study in is that it be beautiful. Mm. Uh, one, one of the most stunning aspects of traditional Islamic civilization was the schools, including yeah. the children's schools, are now museums mm. for people to go and literally uh, be, marvel yeah. at, at their, their beauty. And one of the hallmarks, and I think Prince Charles has talked about this in your country, the ugliness of, of modern yes. architecture well, and... We're living through this, something, I, I think it's um, that Czech writer, I can't remember his name now. Havlek? Havlek? No, no. no. It, um, talks about the uglification of the world. Right. Um, uh, it's a word comes from Alice in Wonderland, actually. Mm -hmm. but, um, but it's true that people now build without any consideration for what, how they're the building fits into its environment, what it does to the street, how it looks to the passerby. It's purely to satisfy a client. You know, the client will wants rooms for 150 offices, so you build a hideous block in the middle of, uh, of things which eliminates the street, eliminates the public square, and, uh, and um, is something which nobody wants to look at, nobody can bear to look at. Uh, you know, and actually, I was very impressed by the, the fact that, that Muhammad Atta, who, uh, uh, who um, flew the, uh, that uh, TWA flight into the t Twin Towers in um, 2001, he, he did a thesis at the University of Hamburg, I think it was Hamburg, on, um, uh, on architecture, uh, the, the, the theme of which was how to restore uh, Aleppo, Halab, to, to its original condition 
as a, as a proper Islamic town, you know, without the, the um, mutilation inflicted upon it by these tower blocks, etc. Uh, so it was as though he was taking revenge on uh, an architectural, uh, architectural practice which had been introduced into the Middle East by Le Corbusier with his plans for Algiers, you know, to wipe the whole thing away and put these motorways in the air on concrete blocks. It's amazing. Uh, and, you know, because of the Arab inferiority complex, there was this huge mood to do this everywhere. We're going to have a modern city with wide uh, streets plowing through these beautiful little alleyways where people lived side by side we, together. We, we have a hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said that towards the latter days you would see the destitute desert Arabs who had been taking care of goats and sheep vie with one another to build increasingly high buildings. Really? Yes. What That's one of his prophetic. prophecies. Yeah. Well, there you are. Um, <laughs> yes. So he was right about that too? Yes. I, he was... <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm. Yes, but this is something my... my uh, Good friend Mawa Asabuni, who is an architect in Homs, has written a, a, a beautiful book called The Battle for Home about this issue. I'm hoping you will invite her here one yes, day. She, uh, in which she uh, documents the extent to which this new way of building in concrete shanties on the edge of, of the city right. and, are, are, are knocking down all the old uh, intimate alleyways, how that has actually contributed to the antagonism of, of the communities towards each other and, and, and fueled the civil war and of course given people no sense of where they belong because they look around them they see this, this ugly set of broken teeth on the horizon you know that's mm. all it is a town right. and she right it's very beautifully about the way in which the Christian and, uh, and Muslim communities in that part of Syria built against each other, or I mean next to each other, with the, the same one, one wall being a church on one side and a mosque on the other, yes. you know. Uh, th this way of actually settling the, settling the, the, the land well, as well, a, um, a joint possession, you know. Yeah, and there's a couple of very interesting, Donner wrote a book about early Islam, and he, he's one of the foremost experts on early Islam, and argues that the archaeological evidence indicates that the Muslims were sharing prayer space with the Christians. Yeah, that's right. um, and, and also uh, Philip Penn's work on when Christians first met Muslims, which is about the Syriac. So, so all of the non-Orthodox churches, how they really saw the Muslims as right. just a great yeah. boon. And I just got a midrash from a, a, a rabbi who's a friend of mine, sent me a midrash about the that the, the Jewish rabbis saw the Muslims as a great blessing when they came into Jerusalem because they were preserving monotheism for the the, the Temple Mount, mm. which was being used as a garbage dump at the time yeah. by by the inhabitants. I want to I want to ask you about um, the great transcendent um, ideas of the of the Greeks, the three these three transcendent ideas of truth, goodness, and beauty, which. I think show up in Islam with the idea of Iman, hmm. I Islam and Ihsan, um, that, that Iman comes out of the truth of God, the reality of God, and then Islam is, is, is a praxis of yeah. goodness, and then Ihsan is making things beautiful. Um, and also we, uh, here, we, 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 we're, we're using the trivium as a kind of, it's, it's really the, it's it's the foundation of of the pedagogy. This idea mm. that that um, that logic, which is 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 the pursuit of truth, grammar, the pursuit of goodness uh, in communication, and then rhetoric in the pursuit of beauty. That these the how do we restore these transcendent values that were shared by mm. all of the great civilizations? I think um, there is no difficulty in explain to people why truth matters you know because uh, if you're not if you don't pursue truth uh, you, you, all your reasoning and thinking is based on on, a, on nothing it's only because you are confident that something is true that you can rely on it 
and goodness likewise. It's the thing without which we cannot rely on each other. So, the, so there's, it's, it's relatively easy to, dis, to defend those things. It's beauty that's the problem. Mm. Uh, I made a film once for the BBC called Why Beauty Matters because I, I, I take the view that, that uh, the search for beauty is part of the search for right relations with others. Mm. Not just right, right relations with God, but right relations with each other. You, you, when, when we enter a, a house and we want to make it our own, we don't make it our own for us only, so that other people can come in and enjoy that, uh, the way it looks. And we really worry about how things should, uh, should be placed so that they harmonize. Right. And everything that we do is actually like that. And manners are part of the cultivation right. of beauty. Uh, uh, and of course, this is something that doesn't need to be explained in the uh, old Islamic way of life, that it mm. was an attempt to make things beautiful, to make your presence not offensive to the other, but part of, of fitting in. And I think that is also na a natural th thing for all human beings to want to fit in. And suddenly, of course, in the modern world, people don't want to fit in, they want to stand out, wearing bright, absurd clothes. You know, the, 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 actually California being the place where this is most often to be observed. Yes. You know, the, the desire to stand out and be unique. Uh, and modern You're at ground zero for yeah. that. <laughs> That's yes. true. But modern building is like that. Yes. You know, the modern architect doesn't want to fit modestly yeah. in and disappear into his surroundings. He I, wants to be that big gesture. I saw one of the things that uh, Yates reminded us of was that things reveal themselves in their passing. And, and there's, there's, I don't think people realize how much we've lost mm. uh, of, of, of goodness. There, there's, there's certainly conserving what is good of the past should be at the essence of our of our endeavors and our challenges and but also recognizing there's still a lot of things that need changing i i really want to thank you for making this stop at zaytuna college um, we one of the things that we're trying to do here is is a restoration of the liberal arts tradition which was central to the islamic tradition we have a uh, uh, a great poet from from the east, from uh, Egypt, who said, "وَإِنْ عَبِقَتْ فِي الْغَرْبِ أَنْفَاسُ ذِكْرِهِ وَفِي الشَّرْقِ عَلِيلٌ تَعَافَ مِنْ الدُرِّ." If the fragrance of God's remembrance pervades the west, the sick man in the east might get well again. <laughs> so right. we're hoping that that's what Zaytuna contributes to, the sick man in the east getting well again. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Scruton and uh, thank you.